Book Three, Chapter Ten, of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Three, Houghton Tower. Chapter Ten, Evening Entertainments. Other amusements were reserved for the evening. While revelry was again held in the great hall, while the tables groaned for the third time since morning with good cheer, and the ruby wine, which seemed to gush from inexhaustible fountains, mantled in the silver flagons, while Seneschal, Sower, and Pantler, with the yeomen of the buttery in the kitchen, were again actively engaged in their vocations, while of the three hundred guests more than half— as if insentient, again vied with each other in prowess with the trencher and the goblet, while in the words of old Taylor, the water-poet, but who was no water-drinker, and who thus sang of the hospitality of the men of Manchester in the early part of the seventeenth century, they had roast, boiled, baked, too, too much, white, claret, sack, nothing they thought too heavy or too hot, can followed can, and pot succeeded pot. During this time, preparations were made for fresh entertainments out of doors. The gardens at Houghton Tower, though necessarily confined in space owing to their situation on the brow of a hill, were beautifully laid out, and commanded from their balustered terraces magnificent views of the surrounding country. Below them lay the well-wooded park, skirted by the silvery Darwin, with the fair village of Waltonley Dale immediately beyond it, the proud town of Preston farther on, and the single-coned nose-point rising majestically in the distance. The principal garden constituted a square, and was divided, with mathematical precision, according to the formal taste of the time, into smaller squares, with a broad, well-kept gravel walk at each angle. These plots were arranged in various figures and devices, such as the sac-foil, the flower de luce, the trefoil, the lozenge, the fret, the diamond, the crossbow, and the oval, all very elaborate and intricate in design. Besides these knots, as they were termed, there were labyrinths, and clipped yew-tree walks, and that indispensable requisite to a garden at the period, a maze. In the centre was a grassy eminence, surmounted by a pavilion, in front of which spread a grass plot of smoothest turf, ordinarily used as a bowling green. At the lower end of this a temporary stage was erected for the mask about to be represented before the king. Torches were kindled, and numerous lamps burned in the branches of the adjoining trees, but they were scarcely needed, for the moon being at the full, the glorious effulgence shed by her upon the scene rendered all other light pale and ineffectual. After supper, at which the drinking was deeper than at dinner, the whole of the revellers repaired to the garden, full of frolic and merriment, and well disposed for any diversion in store for them. The king was conducted to the bowling green by his host, preceded by a crowd of attendants, bearing odiferous torches, but the royal gate being somewhat unsteady, the aid of Sir Gilbert Houghton's arm was required to keep the monarch from stumbling. The rest of the bacchanalians followed, and slated as they were, it will not be wondered that they put very little restraint upon themselves, but shouted, sang, danced, and indulged in all sorts of licence. Opposite the stage, prepared for the maskers, a platform had been reared, in front of which was a chair for the king, with seats for the nobles and principal guests behind it. The sides were hung with curtains of crimson velvet fringed with gold, the roof decorated like a canopy, so that it had a very magnificent effect. James lolled back in his chair, and jested loudly and rather indecorously with the various personages as they took their places around him. In less than five minutes the whole of the green was filled with revellers, and great was the pushing and jostling, the laughing and screaming, that ensued among them. Silence was then enjoined by Sir John Finnett, who had stationed himself on the steps of the stage, and at this command the assemblage became comparatively quiet, though now and then a half-suppressed titter or a smothered scream would break out. Amid this silence the king's voice could be distinctly heard, 
and his coarse jests reached the ears of the astonished audience, provoking many a severe comment from the elders, and much secret laughter from the juniors. The mask began. Two tutelar deities appeared on the stage. They were followed by a band of foresters, clad in Lincoln green, with bows at their backs. The first deity wore a white linen tunic, with flesh-coloured hose and red buskins, and had a purple taffeta mantle over his shoulders. In his hand he held a palm-branch, and a garland of the same leaves was woven round his brow. The second household god was a big brawny varlet, wild and shaggy in appearance, being clothed in the skins of beasts, with sandals of untanned cowhide. On his head was a garland of oak-leaves, and from his neck hung a horn. He was armed with a hunting-spear and a wood-knife, and attended by a large Lancashire mastiff. Advancing to the front of the stage, the foremost personage thus addressed the monarch. "'This day, great king, for government admired, which these thy subjects have so much desired, shall be kept holy in their hearts' best treasures, and vowed to James, as is this month to Caesar, and now the landlord of this ancient tower, thrice fortunate to see this happy hour, whose trembling heart thy presence sets on fire, unto this house the heart of all our shire, does bid thee cordial welcome, and would speak it, in higher notes, but extreme joy doth break it. He makes his guests most welcome, in his eyes love tears do sit, not he that shouts and cries. And we, the antique guardians of this place, I of this house, he of the fruitful chase, since the bold Houghtons from the hill took name, who with the stiff unbridled Saxons came, and so have flourished in this fairer clime, successively from that to this our time, still offering up our immortal powers, sweet incense, wine, and odiferous flowers, while sacred Vesta in her virgin tire, with vows and wishes tends to hallowed fire. Now seeing that thy majesty is thus, greater than household deities like us, we render up to thy most powerful guard this tower, this night is thine, he is thy ward. For by thy helping and auspicious hand, he and his home shall ever, ever stand and flourish in despite of envious fate, and then live like Augustus fortunate. And long, long mayst thou live, to which both men and guardian angels cry, Amen, Amen. James, who had demeaned himself critically during the delivery of the address, observed at its close to Sir Richard Houghton, who was standing immediately behind his chair, eh, "'We cannot say mickle for the rhymes, which are but indifferently strung together, but the sentiments are real and good, and that is all we care for.' On this the second tutelar divinity advanced, and throwing himself into an attitude, as if bewildered by the august presence in which he stood, exclaimed, "'Thou greatest of mortals!' and then stopped as if utterly confounded. The king looked at him for a moment, and then roared out, "'Well, good man, your commencement is pertinent and true enough, and though we be the greatest of mortals, as ye style us, dinna fash yourself about our grandeur, but go on, as if we were nae better nor wiser than your ain simple cell.' But instead of encouraging the dumbfounded deity, this speech completely upset him. He hastily retreated, and in trying to screen himself behind the huntsman, fell back from the stage, and his hound leapt after him. The incident, whether premeditated or not, amused the spectators much more than any speech he could have delivered, and the king joined heartily in the merriment. Silence being again restored, the first divinity came forward once more, and spoke thus. "'Dread lord, thy majesty hath stricken dumb, is weaker godhead.' If to himself he come, 
unto thy servant straight he will commend these foresters and charge them to attend thy pleasure in this park and show such sport to the chief huntsman and thy princely court as the small circle of this round affords and be more ready than he was in words note these speeches given by nichols are derived from the family records of Sir Henry Philip Houghton, baronet, and were actually delivered at a mask representing an occasion of King James's visit to Houghton Tower. End of note. Oh, he'll spoken unto the purpose, good fellow, cried James, and we take this opportunity of assuring our worthy host in the presence of his other guests that we have never had better sport in park or forest than we have this day enjoyed, have never eaten better cheer, nor quaffed better wine than at his board, and altogether have never been more hospitably welcomed. Sir Richard was overwhelmed by his majesty's commendation. I have done nothing, my gracious liege, he said, to merit such acknowledgment on your part, and the delight I experience is only tempered by my utter unworthiness. Ah, oh, who choot, man? replied James jocularly. You merit a vast deal mair than we are said to you. But good folk dinner always get their desserts. Ye can that, Sir Richard. And now, are ye not some other drolleries in store for us? The baronet replied in the affirmative, and soon afterwards the stage was occupied by a new class of performers, and a drollery commenced which kept the audience in one continual roar of laughter so long as it lasted and yet none of these parts had been studied, the actors entirely trusting to their own powers of comedy to carry it out. The principal character was the Cap Justice, enacted by Sir John Finnett, who took occasion in the course of the performance to lampoon and satirise most of the eminent legal characters of the day, mimicking the voice and manners of the three justices, Crook, Houghton, and Doddridge, so admirably that his hearers were well-nigh convulsed, and the three learned gentlemen, who sat near the king, though fully conscious of the ridicule applied to them, were obliged to laugh with the rest. But the unsparing satirist was not content with this, but went on with most of the other attendants upon the king, and being intimately versed in court scandal, he directed his lash with telling effect. As a contrast to the malicious pleasantry of the cap justice were the gambols and jests of Robin Goodfellow, a merry imp who, if he had put people into mischief, was always ready to get them out of it. Then there was a dance by Bill Huckler, Old Crambo, and Tom Bedlam, the half-crazed individual already mentioned as being among the crowd in the base court. This was applauded to the echo and consequently repeated. But the most diverting scene of all was that in which Jem Tospot and the three doll wangos appeared. Though given in the broadest vernacular of the county, and scarcely intelligible to the whole of the company, the dialogue of this part of the piece was so lifelike and natural that every one recognised its truth, while the situations, arranged with the slightest effort and on the spur of the moment, were extremely ludicrous. The scene was supposed to take place in a small Lancashire alehouse, where a jovial peddler was carousing, and where, being visited by his three sweethearts, each of whom he privately declared to be the favourite, he had to reconcile their differences and keep them all in good humour. Familiar with the character in all its aspects, Nicholas played it to the life, and to do them justice, Dames Baldwin, Tetlow, and Nance Redfern were but little, if at all, inferior to him. There was a reality in their jealous quarrelling that gave infinite zest to the performance. "'So the mad body!' exclaimed James, admiringly. "'Those are three braw women. Any on them mon be sax feet as she's an inch, and well made and well favoured too. Sound, Sir Richard, there's nae stand in the spells of your Lancashire witches. <laughs> I'd born and low born they all alike. I would their only witchcraft lay in their iron. I should then hide the less fear on them. But have you aught mair?' "'for it's growing late, and we can we have something to do in that pavilion.' "'Only a merry dance, my liege, in which a man will appear in a dendrological foliage of fronds,' replied the baronet. James laughed at the description, 
and soon afterwards a party of mummers, male and female, clad in various grotesque garbs, appeared on the stage. In the midst of them was the dendrological man, enclosed in a framework of green boughs, like that borne by a modern Jack in the Green. A ring was formed by the mummers, and the round commenced to lively music. While the mazy measure was proceeding, Nance Redfern, who had quitted the stage with Nicholas, and now stood close to him among the spectators, said in a low voice, "'Look there!' The squire glanced in the direction indicated, and to his surprise and terror discerned among the crowd at a little distance the figure of a Cistercian monk. "'He's invisible to every eye except our own,' whispered Nance, "'and he's come to tell me it is time.' "'Time for what?' demanded Nicholas. "'Time for you to seize them two accursed devices, Jem and his mother,' replied Nance. "'They're both on young boards. Jem is the man in the tree, and Elizabeth is the old crone in the red kirtle, and I crown that.' "'You will know her full face when you pluck off her mask.' Oh, "'The monk is gone,' cried Nicholas. "'I've kept my eyes steadily fixed on him, and he's melted into air. "'What has he to do with the devices?' "'He is their fate,' returned Nance, "'and I are acting under his orders. "'Go mount and seize them. I will go with you.' Forcing his way through the crowd, Nicholas ran up the steps, and followed by Nance sprang upon the stage. His appearance occasioned considerable surprise, but as he was recognised by the spectators as the jolly Jem Tospot, who had so recently diverted them, and his companion as one of the three doll wangos, in anticipation of some more fun they received him with a round of applause. But without stopping to acknowledge it, or being for a moment diverted from his purpose, Nicholas seized the old crone, and consigning her to Nance, caught hold of the leafy frame in which the man was encased, and pulled him from under it. But he began to think that he had unkenneled the wrong fox, for the man, though a tall fellow, bore no resemblance to Jem Device, while, when the crown's mask was plucked off, she was found to be a comely young woman. Meanwhile all around was in an uproar, and amidst a hurricane of hisses, yells, and other indications of displeasure from the spectators, several of the mummers demanded the meaning of such a strange and unwarrantable proceeding. "'They are a couple of witches!' cried Nicholas. "'This is Jem Device and his mother Elizabeth!' "'My name is neither Jem nor Device!' cried the man. "'No, mine Elizabeth!' screamed the woman. "'We know the Devices!' cried two or three voices, and these are none of them. Nicholas was perplexed. The storm increased, threats accompanied the hisses, when luckily he espied a ring on the man's finger. He instantly seized his hand and held it up to the general gaze. "'A proof! A proof!' he cried. "'This sapphire ring was given by the king to my cousin Richard Asherton this morning, and stolen from him by Jem Device.' "'Examine their features again,' said Nance Redfern, waving her hands over them. "'Ye will not know them now.' The woman's face instantly altered, many years being added to it in a breath. The man changed equally. The utmost astonishment was evinced by all at the transformation, and the bystanders who had spoken before now cried out loudly, "'We know them perfectly now. They are the two devices.' By this time an officer, attended by a party of halberdiers, had mounted the boards, and the two prisoners were delivered to their custody by Nicholas. "'Ode!' cried the man. "'I will no longer demise my name. I am Jem Device, and this is my mother Elizabeth. But a worse offender than either on us stands afore you. This woman is Nance Redfern, granddaughter of the old hag, Mother Chattox.' I charge her with making wax images and sticking pins in them we intend to kill folk. Who would have killed me myself with her devilry if I hadn't been too strong for her? And that's why her bears me malice and has betrayed me to Squire Nicholas Asherton. Seize her and call me as a witness again her. And as Nance was secured, he laughed malignantly. I care not, replied Nance. I'm now revenged on you both. 
While this impromptu performance took place, as much to the surprise of James as any one else, and while he was desiring Sir Richard Houghton to ascertain what it all meant, at the very moment that the two devices and Nance removed from the stage, an usher approached the monarch, and said that Master Potts entreated a moment's audience of His Majesty. "'Potts!' exclaimed James, somewhat confused. "'Why is he?' "'Ah, oh, yeah, I recollect. A witch-finder? Well, let him approach.' Accordingly, the next moment the little attorney, whose face was evidently charged with some tremendous intelligence, was ushered into the king's presence. After a profound reverence, he said, "'May it please your majesty, I have something for your private ear.' "'I will, then,' replied James, "'approach us more closely. <laughs> what you got to say, sir? Oh, mere again these witches?' "'A great deal, sire.' said Potts, in an impressive tone. "'Something dreadful has happened, something terrible.' "'Eh? What?' exclaimed James, looking alarmed. "'What is it, man? Speak!' "'Murder, sire! Murder has been done!' said Potts, in low, thrilling accents. "'Murder!' exclaimed James, horror-stricken. "'Tell us all about it, and we hope more ado.' But Potts was still circumspect. With an air of deepest mystery, he approached his head as near as he dared to that of the monarch, and whispered in his ear. "'Can this be true?' cried James. "'If say, so, it's very shocking, very sad.' "'It is too true, as your majesty will find on investigation,' replied Potts. "'The little girl I told you of, Janet Device, saw it done.' "'Weel, weel, there's no accounting for human frailty and wickedness.' said James. Let all necessary steps be taken at once. Oh, we will consider what to do. But, dear sir, dinna let the bairn Janet go. Hold her fast. Do you mind that? Now go and cause the guilty party to be put under arrest. And on receiving this command, Master Potts departed. Scarcely was he gone, the Nicholas Asherton came up to the railing of the platform, and, imploring His Majesty's forgiveness for the disturbance he had occasioned, explained that it had been owing to the seizure of the two devices, who, for some wicked but unexplained purpose, had contrived to introduce themselves under various disguises into the tower. Oh, "'You did right to arrest the miscreant, sir. But he heard what has happened.' "'No, my liege.' replied Nicholas, alarmed by the king's manner. "'What is it?' Yeah, "'Come nearer, and ye shall learn, for we wouldna hear it brought to the boat, though, if true, as we canna doubt, it will be known soon enough.' And as the squire bent forward, he imparted some intelligence to him, which instantly changed the expression of the latter to one of mingled horror and rage. "'It is false, sire,' he cried. "'I will answer for her innocence in my life. She could not do it.' "'Your Majesty's patience is abused. "'It is Jenny who has done it, not she. "'But I will unravel the terrible mystery. "'You have the other two wretches prisoners, "'and can enforce the truth from them.' Yeah, "'We will essay to do so,' replied James. "'But we have also another prisoner.' "'Christopher Demdike,' said Nicholas. "'Aye, Christopher Demdike,' rejoined James. "'But another besides him.' "'Mistress Nutter! "'You stare, sir, but it is true. "'She's in yonder pavilion. "'We ken full well who assisted her flight "'and who concealed her. "'Master Potts has told us all. "'It is weel for you that your pure kinsman Richard Asherton "'did us such good service at the boar-hunt to-day. "'We shall not now be unmindful of it, "'even though he cannot send us the ring we gave him.' "'It is here, sire,' replied Nicholas. "'It was stolen from me by the villain Jem Device. "'The poor youth meant to use it for Alison. "'I now deliver it to your majesty, "'as coming from him in her behalf.' "'And we say receive it,' replied the monarch, "'brushing away the moisture that gathered thickly in his eyes. "'At this moment a tall personage wrapped in a cloak, "'who appeared to be an officer of the guard, "'approached the railing. "'I am come to inform your majesty that Christopher Demdike has just died of his wounds,' said this personage. Oh, "'See, he's had a stray death after all,' rejoined Dames. "'Well, we are sorry for it.' "'His portion will be eternal bail,' observed the officer. 
"'How knew you that, sir?' demanded the king sharply. "'You're not his judge.' "'I witnessed his end, sire,' replied the officer, "'and no man who died as he died can be saved. "'The fiend was beside him at his death throes. "'Save us!' exclaimed James. "'Ye dinna say so. "'God sent it! "'Man, but this is gruesome! "'And gaze the flesh creep on one's bains. "'Let his foul carcass be taken away "'and hang it on a gibbet on the hill "'where Malkin Tower since stood, "'as a warning to all such heinous offenders.' As the king ceased speaking, Master Potts appeared, out of breath and greatly excited. "'She has escaped, sire!' he cried. "'Oh, Janet!' exclaimed James. "'If sir so, will hang you in our stead!' "'No, sire. Alison,' replied Potts. "'I can nowhere find her, not—' and he hesitated. "'Well, well, it's no grey matter,' replied James, as if relieved and with a glance of satisfaction at Nicholas. "'I know where Alison is, sire,' said the officer. "'Indeed!' exclaimed James. "'This fellow is strangely officious,' he muttered to himself. "'And where may she be, sir?' he added aloud. "'I will produce her within a quarter of an hour in yonder pavilion,' replied the officer, "'and all that Master Potts has been unable to find.' "'Your Majesty may trust him.' observed Nicholas, who had attentively regarded the officer. "'Depend upon it. He will make good his words.' "'You think so?' cried the king. "'Then we'll put him to the test. "'You will engage to confront Alison with her mother,' he added to the officer. "'I will, sire,' replied the other. "'But I shall require the assistance of a dozen men.' Uh, "'Take twenty, if you will.' "'replied the king. "'I'm impatient to see what she can do.' "'In a quarter of an hour all shall be ready within the pavilion, sire,' replied the officer. "'You have seen one mask and a night, but you shall now behold a different one. "'The mask of death!' "'And he disappeared. "'Nicholas felt sure he would accomplish his task, for he had recognised in him the Cistercian monk.' "'Where is Sir Richard Asherton of Middleton?' inquired the king. "'He left the tower with his daughter Dorothy immediately after the banquet,' replied Nicholas. "'I am glad of it, right glad,' replied the monarch. "'The terrible intelligence can be the better broken to them. "'If it had come upon them suddenly it might have been fatal, especially to the poor lassie. "'Let Sir Ralph Asherton of Whaley come to me, and Master Richard Knoll of Reed.' "'Your Majesty shall be obeyed,' replied Richard Houghton. The King then gave some instructions respecting the prisoners, and bade Master Potts have Jennet in readiness. And now to see what terrible thing had happened. End of chapter 10